Wonderful ceremony, yeah? Very beautiful to come together and hear the good words of Lung Paul and others. So, first of all, I'd like to express my gratitude to Lung Paul Pasano and Ajahn Nyani Ko and the Sangha here for your uh, gracious hospitality and your diligent practice and all the lay people who make this place possible. It's, it's unique. I live in a kind of little island called Tisarana. It's a little Buddhist island. Well, this feels very metropolitan to me. <laughs> kind of like it's a Buddhist city. It has a whole lovely different vibe to it. So congratulations to, to create this kind of sanctuary that engages so many people and so much goodness. It's a, it's a real... Well, we all know that. It's very rare. It's a gem. So, Anumotana. And then I, because I'm a senior monk, I get to fly. <laughs> fly all the way here. So I flew from Ottawa to San Francisco. And uh, this is this vast continent that I flew across. And then in end of July, August, I drove with our steward. I didn't drive. I rode. He drove to Newfoundland to greet Lompo Sumedo, who flew from Ottawa to St. John's, Newfoundland. And we toured Newfoundland for three, what was it, almost three weeks, which is really, really cool, uh, really, really nice, because he's, he's a beloved friend and teacher, and to be with him in, his, uh, in this kind of end phase of his life, he's still very, very vibrant. Uh, it's a great honor. And then we, then we drove back. So that trip, we had to drive because we couldn't rent a car in Nova Scotia because of COVID, because of complexities. But that trip was 5,200 kilometers. Did you do miles or kilometers here? Miles. It was a lot of miles. <laughs> Many miles. And then flying across here. And this is a vast, vast continent. And yet, and yet, there are not that many spiritual communities, I think, that are so vibrant and uh, so significant. This is a vast area. Lompo was saying, um, well, so we're very, very fortunate, obviously. We're very fortunate to be here. But Lompo was saying that as a senior monk, he has the privilege of um, engaging with people in the very, very best behavior. I have the same good karma. Um, but it's interesting when you engage with people who bring out the worst in you, isn't it? Because not everyone can be Lompa Pasano, and not every moment is a moment in the monastery, and the moments in monastery sometimes also bring up other things. So it's very important to have occasions where we can express generosity, where we can feel what Dana Baramita is about, that it's so, such a uplifting and, and um, important part of the spiritual life. And then to come together with Kalyanamitta and be inspired by Dhamma, to come face to face now after COVID, these are, these are very important things because we are we're social beings. We're not isolated particles in space. So we have a time of inspiration, a time of, of moral reflection, a time of uh, sharing beautiful flowers and beautiful food with beautiful people. And then we go back to our lives, to the ordinary of our lives, to the challenges of our lives. And we all know that you know, it's not easy. It's not easy being a human being. Uh, that quite often people, we face people who are not nice, who are not moral, who want to take advantages, uh, advantage of us, and yet we have to live in a real world. But to become like someone who is manipulative and cruel, I wouldn't want that either. I wouldn't want to join that sangha. <laughs> I don't want to call it a sangha. So we, we, are, we are challenged. And Lompa Cha would, I always remember this one, you know, in, at Wapapong, we, we'd have a, a work period in the afternoons, two or three hours of sweeping leaves and hauling water and such like. And uh, Lumpo would sometimes say, why do you 
monks always just hang out or work with the monks you like? Why don't you work with the monks you dislike? And I said, well, obviously, because I don't like this guy. <laughs> I just, why would I work with him? <laughs> so, uh, but I'll, you know, he was pointing to the fact that maybe there's something to learn from this monk. I don't think I ever did it that much, <laughs> to be honest. But I, you don't really have to seek out difficult people. Difficult people seem <laughs> to seek you out. Such is life. So the way Lampard Chak taught was that the person that triggers anger and the situations that trigger anger are the situations you learn about anger, obviously. Obviously, the situations that trigger anxiety uh, and fear are the situations where you learn about anxiety and fear. How could it be otherwise? I mean, it's sort of very obvious. We don't have to seek it out. It'll come. It'll come. The situations that teach you about old age are the aging, aging of the body, the sickness of the body. And so Lumpa Cha said, you know, face that right on. See that, that that person who presses your triggers is your Rajan. Sorry, <laughs> don't tell him that, right? But if someone, I think the first Dhamma talk I gave Lumpa was Ajahn Jung. Jung is mosquito. <laughs> like I couldn't speak Thai, and so Lompa Cha was always messing about with us. So I said, V, you give a talk. I, huh? you, I, I, don't, I don't know what to say. So I knew, I knew Ajahn, and I kind of knew Mosquito. So I gave a talk, Ajahn Mosquito. And <laughs> it was true, you know, because I really hated mosquitoes. And I, I, I still don't love them, but I learned not to kill them. <laughs> and learn to be a bit more patient and use mosquito nets too and mosquito repellent. Now we have a lot of Ajahn Jungs in life. Right? We have people who um, do trigger things in us. And if the situation is safe, and that's, that's very important, that if a situation is unsafe or burnout or overwhelming, then somehow we have to get out of the situation because we don't really have enough mindfulness. You need mindfulness to really uh, understand how these things work. But there's much of life that, although it's very, very challenging, we can have enough space to witness things. So that's what we're always doing in meditation. We're developing the witnessing consciousness uh, as we meditate. So you're meditating and you start to get some pain in your leg. You learn to witness pain, not to hurt yourself. You can move if you want, but you learn to see the pain is an object in witnessing awareness. You can know that. You can worry about it, which is okay, but you can also witness it. And that's the beginning of freedom. Because now, although there's physical pain, you know it won't hurt you. You know you'll be able to sit through it and just patiently observe it. And whereas before, you would move all the time if you had discomfort, you would you begin to witness discomfort and you find a silence or a peace in the mind irrespective of comfort or discomfort. It's independent of comfort or discomfort. And that's really a neat kind of insight because you see that the peace of the mind is not dependent on the situation. Now that's easy. That's easy. But those easy lessons are very, very important to do. So what I always recommend folk to do is Learn to, learn to, I, I use sound a lot, listening. Learn to listen and, and learn not to engage with the sound. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say, like if I'm just listening now, I let the sound come to me, then I notice the mind is silent in the listening. So listening is very receptive. And listening is a good synonym for awareness, because awareness is very uh, receptive. So if I, if, I, if I train myself just to be with sound, but not be judgmental of the sound, so like let's say if I'm talking now, and maybe Yom Id over there starts talking or something, and I get irritated, then I'm going out to the sound. Be quiet. Stop doing that. Yeah? 
I'll, I'll leave that to Lompa Pasana then to adjudicate that. <laughs> but if I just notice, oh, irritation feels this way. The sound is irritating. And I just stay with witnessing. Then the tendency to go towards irritation and annoyance falls away. I'm not feeding it. Sound is still the same. Sound is still the same. Oh, yeah. And I'm just witnessing. So when you do exercises like this, you begin to develop... Uh, the capacity to know the world without reacting to the world. And these are simple exercises, but if you do them a lot, what it begins to do, it, it sort of develops a, um, a capacity not to react, I would say. A capacity not to react. So then you get a more complex situation. So as I was saying to a friend, you go to, you go to work, and there's some character that, that pokes you. You know, he calls you, you stupid Buddhist, <laughs> or some kind of insult, or is domineering, or, or whatever, and you have an emotional reaction to that. We all do. This is your Ajahn. Now, if the person is abusive, then you go to your manager and you say, this is abusive, don't do that. So I'm not saying you just are a sort of a Buddhist doormat and say, oh, please, step on me. No. But in the course of events, this happens. People are rude to us, or, or whatever, and if, if we're developing the witnessing consciousness, witnessing, oh, rudeness feels like this, we'll see our reaction towards anger, towards blame, and we don't follow the, the, the reaction in thought, we just feel it in our bodies, then the tendency towards anger begins to fall away. So I become adept at the understanding of anger, I become adept at the letting go of anger. Now the letting go of anger or fear or worry or whatever it is, letting go does not mean that you don't feel it. Letting go is that you don't think it. There's a difference. If I'm anxious about tomorrow, let's say, no, let's say Tuesday, I have to take a flight to Canada and I get anxious about the flight. I can't, why I get anxious? Well, let's say there's a COVID out outbreak in the middle of Dakota or something like that, and, and I get anxious about the plane, and I've done everything I can, then there's a difference between the feeling of anxiety and the thoughts of anxiety, right? It's different. It's different. Just like if I hear a sound over there, I think, who's talking there? Who are they? That's not the sound. That's my thinking about the sound. So letting go, or non-attachment, or ploy wong, uh, is, is fully feeling life, but not getting caught in the thinking, in the storyline. And if you notice the storyline, it's always egotistical. It's all about me and them and me and them. Whereas the feelings in the body of anger or fear, whatever, they are as they are. They're just natural phenomena. They're neither good nor bad. They're uncomfortable or they're comfortable. Yeah, they're not pleasant. Some are pleasant, some are unpleasant. But just the very feeling of being annoyed is simply a feeling just as a sound is simply a sound. This takes great attention. Uh, it, takes, it takes a lot, of, a lot of care to actually notice emotion as it is, because we either want to get rid of it, we want to distract, or we want to blame. So one of the things that, that happens, of course, is that because we're not always with Lompa Pasano, and there are people who draw out of us the negative parts of our lives, because we do have that. They draw out of us pettiness, or maybe jealousy comes up, or anger, or fear, and, and they're the triggers for that. Then one of, the, one of the ways to kind of play with that is say, what if Lone Pao Cha was sitting next to me? How would I react? You know, if Lone, like, or Lone Pao Pasana was sitting beside me, I'd really behave myself. <laughs> so you kind of bring in the Ajahn, you bring in the Buddha, and we played with this, um, me and uh, a good friend, Nick Scott, we did a, we did a walk across, uh, we, we traveled in 1990, I think, from Poland to St. Petersburg. My parents are from Latvia, from Eastern Europe, and I'd never been there, and I wanted to see, and I can speak a bit of Latvian. So we took local buses, and we went through Belarus, and then we ended up in Lithuania, and on that journey, we, we, we kept meeting all kinds of strange people because we looked pretty strange too. And uh, I don't think the Latvians had ever, ever seen a Buddhist monk before. There were, a lot of them were kind of, what is that? 
And so we decided to use a kind of a game. We played a game. And whenever we saw someone who was coming at us in a strange way, we say, that's Indra. Now, you know who Indra is? Inda, in the god in Buddhism. Indra is a god who tests people. Right? So the Indra may be... And Indra has many functions, I think. I'm not a good in mythology. But Indra kind of dresses up as a poor person and then tests the rich person. or So like, like, a, like a trickster. So it was a really fun game because as this person was coming out, I said, that's Indra. And then, okay, what can I learn from Indra? What can I learn from this person? Or this is Lompa Cha teaching me. What can I learn from that? That changes your mind from this is an enemy that I have to destroy, or just being constantly reactive. Because if we're just reactive through our habits of greed, hatred, and delusion, then we are victims. We're total victims of life. We have no freedom. We might have circumstantial freedom, like we come here and it's comfortable and so on, but as soon as the circumstances change to something more complex or difficult, we just react through the same ways. There is no freedom there. There's no freedom. So it was, it was really quite fun. And walking across Latvia, we were once in a, in this, uh, we were, it was very hot, and we, we were carrying backpacks and sleeping out and so on. And a couple of policemen came, and we said, oh, here comes Indra. <laughs> and like they'd never seen any of these chaps, and I didn't have my robes on, I just had a bathing cloth on. So I kind of in my heart said, hi, Indra. And they were great. And they gave us a lift about 40 miles down the road because we were just walking. R really good. But, but, but you know, consider that like, okay, let's say you have to go to work Monday. What day is today? Today is Saturday. Sunday? Sunday? And it, we probably have to go to work Monday. And there's probably someone in the office who you'd really not see again the rest of your life. Maybe. <laughs> or someone somewhere, right? Now, as that person approaches your consciousness, as that person comes into consciousness, the first reaction, oh God, there he is. Oh no, she's, oh God, I just can't, I just can't work here anymore. That's already a victim. You're already a victim. You're not even there yet. And that's memory. That's what memory does. That's just a memory and a perception. It might be very valid. You know, the person might be quite manipulative and you do have to be careful. You have to be streetwise. But still, but still, you could say, all right, I'm going to try to use this situation, now this social situation, to actually observe how the emotions arise in consciousness. Now that's witnessing. Not dismissing the, the real need to be streetwise, but now I'm going to use this person as a teacher. Now if you have a situation where it's, it's not life-threatening or dangerous or in all of that, it's just annoying and it's kind of safe, which is what a lot of monastic life is like that. It's not dangerous. It's not safe. I mean, it is safe. I think it is safe. But it's simply very boring. And something just annoying. Someone just annoys you. You end up like sitting to the, next to a monk that you'd never have related to before. And what that does, it brings out a kind of limitation of the mind, a bias, uh, a prejudice, or whatever. And then you think, I think I'll go to another monastery. No, no, that's not going to work. And they say, no, no, this is my teacher. This is teaching me about this lack of empathy I can have with this person, this lack of compassion. Why am I so judgmental? So then you witness. So the person comes into your field of consciousness, and then you feel, oh, judgment feels that way. Or it might be anxiety. Anxiety feels this way. And as you do that, the witnessing consciousness becomes stronger than the emotions. And as the witnessing consciousness becomes stronger than the emotions, you see, actually, that's very peaceful. The emotions will never be peaceful. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they're nice. But they just do what emotions do. Emotions don't do peace. <laughs> they do excitement. They do worry. They do anger. But the silence of knowing or the witnessing is not an emotion. You know, when I, when I feel an emotion, I feel it in my body, I witness it, that witnessing is not anger or fear. It's not happy or unhappy, it just knows. And that knowing, that witnessing, that silent being is something we're always trying to pay attention to. 
because that's our real home. This is what Lumpa Cha would say. Your real home is not the emotional world. Your real home is that, that, that silent knowing, Puru, uh, as we say in Thai, or the one who knows. When Lopo Sumedho says, it's like this, you know, those of you whom I had been listening to his talks, he's been saying that constantly, year upon year. It's like this. Now, if you really use that as a witnessing mantra, then what does it do to you? Well, it makes you pay attention to the present moment. If you just agree, it's like this, Ben Yang Ni Yang in Thai. You use that a lot in Thai, yeah? Ben Yang Ni Yang. Well, of course, Ben Yang Ni Yang. It can't be any other way. It is like this. But if you actually use that, and, and this is the idea of the awakened mind or witnessing consciousness, you have to awaken to how it is. So when Lopo says to us, it's like this, he's asking us, okay, well, what is it like to feel anger or to feel upset? Or feel, what is it really, really like to be like that? And as you do that, you see, well, that, the emotion changes, but the witnessing doesn't change because it's always there, it's always available. So peace is not kind of getting rid of anything, it's understanding things. The beauty of this kind of practice is that as you witness greed, hatred, and delusion as objects that come and go, and you no longer indulge in the subjective thinking, I hate you, or I'm a terrible person, I shouldn't have hatred, I should always have loving kindness, that doesn't work. Who can have loving kindness all the time? Right? Sometimes you just hate. Why not? Like, is it really that bad to hate? Do you have a choice? You can say to yourself, I'm not going to hate anyone for two weeks. Good luck. <laughs> because hatred is not yours. It's a condition that arises through stimulation. What's problematic is believing in it. So problematic is believing in it that you shouldn't have the hate, or that it's the other person's fault, and that's believing in it as a kind of fixed reality. But knowing it, oh, this is the dharma of anger. Anger feels this way. is not a judgment against it. By precepts, yeah, we practice right speech. We practice not engaging in it. That's our moral duty. But inwardly, as we witness our lives, if we begin to see something like fear, say, as I, I always talk about my own fears as a, um, I, I was, I say this a million times, but it's like, I've only got one story, so. Um, <laughs> my, my problem wasn't so much hatred, although there was plenty of that too. Uh, it was more social anxiety and fear and that kind of thing and self-hatred. And as I witnessed it over the years, then I wasn't feeding the fear. And it's this feeding or nurturing, which we mean, like in, in the Pali you have the word upadana. Upadana means attachment, but it also means fuel. So let's say, uh, go back to anger. Um, let's say anger arises, and then you, you think angry thoughts, or you hate yourself for the anger. Then you're fueling, or you're giving food to more anger for the future, correct? Right? So the word nibban is about cooling, or not, no longer fueling anything. Same situation, the anger arises, now you're witnessing it. Woo. That's really tight in the stomach. My breathing's really shallow. Maybe I make my breathing. You witness it. You know it. You know it. You know it. You're no longer feeding it. You're not saying you should not be angry, but you're no longer believing that the anger is someone else's fault. You know anger as an object in awareness. And then the anger begins to cease. It begins to fade. So I found that very true with fear and anxiety, social anxiety and so on. I just witnessed it and witnessed it. And witnessed. But it's not fun. It's not pleasant, right? Uh, there's nothing nice about it, but it is very important. It's very important. So if you see life that way, that those things which trigger off suffering, and you see, this is my chance to develop Barami, that's what Lompo would say, that these, these situations of challenge are, are my partners in developing Barami, my ajans. you see it that way, then it's no longer like... It, there's no longer... All of life's difficulties become purposeful, right? So even the situation that produces anger has purpose in it, has meaning in it, because this is where I'll actually understand that. And how else will I understand that? 
by running away and living under a rock. Good luck. So then we have the freedom which is not dependent on position, place, not dependent on in any, any situation. Then we can enjoy the beauty of this situation, but then we're no longer bound by this situation because the, the heart's free. It's not, it's not really bound by those things. Obviously, the th we, can, we can also develop very wholesome characteristics. And that's what I was saying at the beginning of this talk, developing like generosity, uh, moral integrity. These are a huge foundation for this other kind of work. Um, thinking uh, wholesome thoughts about, like, like the, I have, a, I have a very, I had a lovely mom, and uh, I was with her till she was 96. And uh, so I created, a, uh, when she died, I created a shrine for her. I have a picture of mom, and flowers, and candle, and, and uh, I have some of her ashes there. And I constantly light the candle, all the time. When the candle goes out, I light it. And each time I just focus on my mom's picture, and that brings up love into the heart. This is important too. Because there's much of life which is very, very uplifting and beautiful, and we need to engage in that too. Otherwise, if it's just about the negative stuff, it's very, very hard. So beauty is important. You know, the beauty of, of a skyscape, like you know, the beautiful views from here, and the trees, uh, the beauty of a, of a child's playing the recorder. So these kinds of things are, I would say, they're, they're about mudita. You know, we have, we have a capacity to experience beauty and joy. And it doesn't have to be just attachment. It, it, it uplifts the heart in a very significant way. When I see these flower arrangements, I say, Ooh, satu, isn't that lovely? So I can, I can rejoice in that goodness. That uplifts the heart. So anything that we do in that way, the sense of uh, open-heartedness, generosity, moral integrity, it gives us a sense of, of, of like a platform that helps us very, very much in dealing with those more, more difficult things. Lumpur Cha used to, like one of the things when, as young monks in Thailand, I was talking about this the other, last night, I think, but we were very keen, you know, we were really kind of gang ma kind of monks. <laughs> I think we were, weren't we? <laughs> so we we're, you know, really like lots of, lots of practice, lots of practice, lots of practice. And, and, and Ajahn Chah would, would I mean, he, he would just tell me like, well, you know, give it five years and, you know, you might feel a bit better. <laughs> you know, I think, well, two years, I should have this done by then. But no way, Jose. It's, it's a marathon. It really is a marathon. But if you see it that way, if you see it that way, that, okay, there is this component of my heart, which is um, a lot of fear and anxiety, but I'm going to work on that this lifetime, then it's okay. I'm just going to keep working on that and getting better at understanding it, not attaching it. Then it's a doable. But if you think, oh, oh, there's fear again. I thought I was past fear. I didn't think I had any anxiety. Then you're just caught in the, in the thinking mind. But the feeling body, you trust that, trust in awareness, and then just see how it evolves. So when we talk about faith, it's not just faith in dogma, not just faith in some kind of being a Buddhist, it's faith in awareness, faith in knowing, faith in that kind of witnessing consciousness. All right, I'll leave that for you.